Part 1. You will hear a tourist asking about cruises around the harbour. First, look at questions 1 to 7. Good morning, Blue Harbour Cruises. How can I help you? Oh, um, um, good morning. Um, can you tell me something about the different cruises you run? Well, we run three cruises every day, each offering something slightly different. Oh, let me just get a pencil so I can make a note of this. Right. Firstly, there's the Highlight Cruise, then we do the Noon Cruise, and we also have our Coffee Cruise. Mm. Could you tell me a bit about them, when they leave, how often, that sort of thing? Well, the highlight cruise is $16 per person, and that leaves at 9.30 every morning and takes two hours to go around the harbour. Right, 9.30. And do you get coffee or refreshments? No, but there's a kiosk on board where you can buy drinks and snacks, and we do provide everyone with a free souvenir postcard. Right. And then there's our noon cruise at $42 per person. Th this is more expensive, but, of course, it takes longer, and for that price you get a three-course lunch. Oh, that sounds good. And what about the last one? That's the coffee cruise. Well, that's $25 each. It takes two and a half hours. When does that leave? At a quarter past two daily. And presumably the coffee is included? Yes, and sandwiches are served free of charge. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. I think the coffee cruise would suit us best, as lunch is included at the hotel. Can I book for two people for tomorrow, please? No need to book. Just be down at the quay at two o'clock. All our cruises depart from jetty number two. Can you tell me where that is exactly? Yes. Number two jetty is opposite the shops. It's clearly signposted. Right. And can you tell me, is there a commentary? Yes, there's a commentary on all the cruises. Is it possible to listen to the commentary in Japanese? My friend doesn't speak much English. It's in English only, I'm afraid. But the two guides usually speak some Japanese, so she'll be able to ask questions. Oh, fine. Oh, and one other thing. I should just mention that it gets extremely hot on the upper deck at this time of year, so it's a good idea to wear a hat. Otherwise, you could get quite badly sunburnt. Right, I'll remember that. Thanks very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. First, look at questions 11 to 14.
Listen carefully. Well, Mr. Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that、um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My、uh, my very thorough re-examination and the the analyst report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor, that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues? I think、um, I think your condition has a lot to do with、um, shall we call it. Way of life, habits. Way of life, habits. Yes. Now tell me, Mr. Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And、uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes, I smoke what about forty, fifty a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But、uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's it's no good. You see, fifty a day is overdoing it. You must admit, you must cut down at least that. Ah,、oh, yes, I know that when you're feeling tense, you, you you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you, but in the long run, I do advise you to make to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course, but well. It's easy to say, give it up or cut it down, but oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort, or or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see, well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits. Right. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast. The usual: a cereal followed by bacon and eggs, with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two. Then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I, uh, yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh, yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch. No, first brunch. A cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub. All very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinner's around about eight. Er,、uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet, but、uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then well then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner we read or watch TV, but I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend. That you, that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. 
instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but、uh... eleven says right. Well, that's all right, but lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad. A salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb. Granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, doctor. But no. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah, I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard, and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly, but what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did. The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time, and I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite. I'm afraid, I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess.、Mm, that's okay, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the twenty-four test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with twelve test stations, but not twenty-four. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four, and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure that I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discuss the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that, and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen, organise your thoughts, and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the marks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that, it goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to 13 weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardised test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills.
So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed, and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.